Hello Booktube, welcome back to my channel and welcome to the next in the series called A Closer Book. This is where I talk about three of my recent reads. Today we're going to talk about three books that I've read recently. The first one is An American Marriage by Tayari Jones and this one has gotten a lot of publicity because it's been nominated for the National Book Award as well as it's been nominated for the Women's Prize for Fiction and even here on Booktube it was nominated as a candidate for the Booktuber Prize. And I'm going to talk about the book, not so much its eligibility for these prizes, because I think the book has a lot to say. The author really came through with a real voice, a real exploration of what it means to be an American, a black American with hopes and dreams that sometimes just fade away into nothingness because of the reality of life. Whether or not this makes that kind of story eligible for the prize, I don't know. I'm not going to talk about it, but... Here's what the book is about. In short stance, we meet a couple, Celestial and Roy, and they're newlyweds, only 18 months into their marriage, when Roy is accused of a crime that he says he didn't commit, and he's sentenced to a long stint in jail. And Celestial, as his wife, is being asked to wait for him for a really long period, even though their relationship is so new that they don't quite have the foundation that will sustain this long and difficult separation. And while at first glance it seems that the title, The American Marriage, is about Roy, Roy and Celestial, there are many other examples of marriage and relationship discussed in this book. And so we get a chance to see what relationship and commitment looks like through lots of other characters, but also from lots of other perspectives. And so we are treated to lots of various examples of common law relationships and relationships that started in unconventional ways and what family looks like after abandonment and death and loss and separation in lots of ways and from lots of sources. So an American marriage is not limited to just these two young people, these young 30-somethings who have their whole lives and careers ahead of them when those plans are interrupted. And I thought that the author did a really good job of exploring the reality, the harsh reality of having these dreams and having the world just force compromise onto you. So I really appreciated that. The first part of the novel, well not the first part, but after Roy is sentenced, the rest of the first part of the novel takes place in epistolary format. So we get to see these letter exchanges, kind of like pen pals, where Roy and Celestial are writing to each other, him from jail, and her from her place on the outside, feeling like she needs to create this bridge that keeps Roy grounded, keeps Roy connected to what he's missing on the outside, even though he's not he's not able to participate in it. And <laughs> while that is very interesting, while it does make for an opportunity to see how these people are processing the fact that, you know, they're young there were young couples still settling into their relationship and trying to establish who they are in connection with their partner. We see those growing pains continuing even through their letter exchange, where they try to fight over a letter exchange. And that's funny. But there's also this issue that they're not really being their true selves because even as they're preparing to visit with each other, they write each other letters to explain in advance their awkwardness when they are face to face. And so I thought that that was a pretty unexpected and in some places shocking twist on what marriage is if you know people are separated by one person being incarcerated in that you get to see the person when you visit and you get to have some kind of face-to-face -face interaction but that the reality of your relationship is still happening in that separation is still happening through or still being forced to happen through these other channels and so i thought that that was interesting but the characters the author did a lot she she wrote multiple perspectives here and so she offered the reader an opportunity to see behind the public presentation of these characters to kind of see what they are inside to kind of get an idea of their motives and their inclinations and their tendencies and while i feel like it established some kind of intimacy with each character to the point where we weren't sure who we were rooting for 
it also created some distance which i think was the maybe the point of doing this so while you are rooting for one character you are almost forced to root against the other and i thought that that was really interesting and really well done i felt like the book was emotional at the end i cried when i closed the final page i sobbed because of all of what the author had brought this story that was just unfolding almost without you're being able to well of course without you being able to do anything about it the story's already been written but it made the reader it made me feel a little helpless um to see these people with all their plans with all their goals with an entire future ahead of them and to see how all of those could just be railroaded and everything swept aside because of the the injustice done to a group of people just because of their race and so i think that this is a really good example of racial prejudice and what racial discrimination and racial profiling can result in but of course there were a few negatives and i felt like even though the author was i felt like she was trying to say that this is not the totality of the black experience i felt like she played a little bit too much to the stereotypes they reinforced all the stereotypes of being black so roy as much as you wanted to root for him and think about him as being this great guy he was also really trifling and I mean, I couldn't excuse his trifling behavior. And his wife, Celestial, you know, there were things that she said and did that brought her, brought her and all the women that she represents right back into the 1950s and maybe even back to the 1910s and 1920s during the suffragette movement. And then there's the best friend, Andre, who, oh my goodness, a lot of these characters were not likable and i guess that's the point these are real people and the author was presenting real multi-dimensional multifaceted complex individuals but it was hard to like them at points but also easy to root for them and easy to get behind the story and get invested in what was being presented here so i really liked this i really liked the pacing of the novel and how the story was told in in lots of different formats like i said we had the letter exchange epistolary format we had a lot of flashbacks multi-perspective going back and forth between all these different characters as they experienced things and we saw the same thing happening to through two people's eyes and i thought that that gave a really good all-round view of the situation but four stars for this one if you haven't read it yet if you're the one other person who hasn't read this then I recommend that you pick it up I gave it four stars I really liked it of course it has its flaws but that is not reason enough not to pick up a book An American Marriage by Terry Jones is book number 60 if you can believe this book number 60 in my 2019 reading so I am now officially halfway through my yearly reading goal and I'm very excited and the reason I'm filming this today and not the other books that I'm going to be reading for my next review I need to return this one to the library it was actually due yesterday and I didn't get a chance to return it so I now have to return it today by paying a 25 cent late fee but it's fine I get to read books almost for free from the library I don't mind paying a late fee here and there but stay tuned for the next two books that I'm gonna review after I've read them. book number 61 in my 2019 reading is the wife by Mick Willitzer and I read this one because I needed to read something that had been adapted for a movie this was made into a movie last year and it's won a lot of awards so there has been a little resurgence in the popularity of this book even though it's almost 15 years old. The Wife is not Mibulitzer's first novel, but it does carry a little bit of the awkwardness of maybe a book that was written in her early career as a writer. But I loved a lot of things about this book. So first I'll tell you what the story is about if you didn't, if you're not already familiar. Joan and Joe Castleman, they're a husband and wife team, and their names are so phonetically similar that you might think that all aspects of their life are in sync. In fact, the facade that they present to the world is of a real team, a real partnership. And the decades long relationship that they have been going through seems like they are very supportive and inclusive of each other. 
However, as Joan introduces herself and her husband to us, we see that all is not quite the partnership that it first appears. So when we meet them, they're in the first class section of an airplane bound for Finland, where Joe, the famous novelist, is about to receive the Helsinki Prize, which is really just one step down from the Nobel Prize because let's face it, Joe is good, but he's not quite that good. And while we see Joan luxuriating in the trappings of his accomplishments, we see the buxom stewardess who comes over to offer him cookies. <laughs> and then almost as an afterthought, making a not quite identical offer to his wife. Even in the midst of all of that, Joan makes her announcement to the reader, even before she makes it to her husband, that this for her is the last event. After this last time, she's done. But first, because she's already committed to it, she must endure this final time of Joe being celebrated and feted and fussed over, all while she recalls her own literary ambitions that she's kind of had to put on pause while she's become Joe's companion and supporter. Because in fact, when they met, Joan was a talented writer herself, a student in Joe's creative writing class. When he was a college professor and she was a student at Smith College in the 1950s. And while all of that happened in the 1950s, when it was almost impossible to dream of becoming a novelist herself, the world simply must have changed and it can't still be ruled by this boys club that Joe seems to be a willing participant in. The kind of club that refuses to allow women, no matter how talented, to get to the same level of success that male writers seem to achieve almost effortlessly. And so now, even though we seem to have this idealized marriage born out of almost 40 years of togetherness, we are now being treated to the inside story and the narrator through a series of flashbacks takes us through various points of their relationship to show the development of their life and the development of the compromise and how along the wayside her literary ambitions have had to have been put aside because she was trying to prop up and support her husband. What makes this book special is Meg Willister's commentary on the role of women in relationships and indeed from the title, The Wife. Who a wife is and what she achieves, what she accomplishes and what she has to give up of herself in order to give to the relationship and to give to the world. And so she achieves this through a series of comparing the narrator herself, the narrator's mother, friends of other famous novelists that are littered through the story, their wives and who they are and what we see of them in relationship and how these women present themselves in public groups versus how they talk when it's just a group of women kind of letting loose. She also treats us to the story of Joe's former wife, the wife that he abandoned to begin the relationship with the narrator, as well as his mother and several other women, several other wives that are mentioned here. And their stories are just kind of touched upon, but they become such important figures in the story that it's as though all of these women share the role of main character because they are all these wives. And I thought that that was brilliant. So even though I have a few criticisms, like I feel like there were some parts of the book that were a little bit awkward. I loved a lot of things about this book. I love Meg Willis's treatment of the theme and the way she really delved into the changing face of femininity and the changing face of feminism as we are exposed to how the literary ambitions that women have have changed over the years from the perspective of will of the main character herself but also seeing other female writers emerging through the years and some of the things that they've given up and some of the personal criticisms that seem to be cast upon them in exchange for any modicum of success that they might achieve in a literary way. Like a woman can't just be a good writer. She has to be a good writer, but also have compromised in this other way. As though the club, the boys club that has kept women out has not evaporated even in the process of these 40 years. So I really liked a lot of things about this book and I highly recommend it. If you haven't read it before, it's pretty short. It's just over 200 pages and I liked it. I liked a lot of things about it. Now I can go watch the movie because I really want to see how they adapt this for the screen. I know in the movie, the husband is not getting the Helsinki Prize. He's actually getting the Nobel Prize. So. I really want to see how, what they changed and what they kept from the story. But also, I want to go on now to read everything that Meg Wolitzer has written. 
I really liked how she approached these themes and how she used these metaphors and these sentences to communicate how these who these people were and how they were changing and I can't wait to see how she does it in her later writings so that was book 61 of my 2019 reading. Book number 62 of my 2019 reading is A Natural Way of Things by Charlotte Wood. And I read this one because of hashtag Aussie April, which is a readathon that I'm participating in in April, where I'm trying to read more books by Australian authors this month. And one of the prompts is to read a Stella Prize winner. This book won the Stella Prize in 2016, which if you haven't watched my videos about Aussie April, the Stella Prize is a literary prize that is awarded to female writers in... Australia and this book of course is set in Australia set in the Australian outback and the synopsis is that we have these two women who are awaking on who <laughs> and the synopsis which if you which if you're not familiar 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 the Stella which if you're not familiar the Stella Prize is a literary prize offered to which if you're not familiar, the Stella Prize is a literary prize given to female authors in Australia. And usually the books are supporting women themes. <laughs> which if you're not familiar, this which if you're not familiar, the Stella Prize is an Australian literary prize given to Australian female writers. And quite often I think the books celebrate themes that are about women's issues. And this one is definitely <laughs> definitely meets that mark. The synopsis of this book is we have these two young women, Yolanda and Verla, they seem to be the main characters in this novel, and when we meet them, they're waking up in this room, it's uh, unknown circumstances, and they've been robbed of their material comforts. They no longer have their clothes or any of their belongings from their former life. They're waking up in this brand new circumstance except that they kind of recognize each other, but they don't necessarily know how they got there. So first they've been removed from the life that they knew, their clothes and all their belongings are taken away, and then their heads are shaved, and seem like they've been drugged and they don't really know how they got to where they are, and then they wake up, someone has dressed them in these very uncomfortable itchy clothes, and they're made to wear these bonnets that seem to be like Amish bonnets, which seem to be like a symbol of repression. In any case, Yolanda and Verla seem to recognize each other, but as they meet the eight other women on this compound, there's something a little familiar about them, and eventually they recognize each other because all of these women have been involved in some kind of a sex scandal, usually because of a relationship with a political or celebrity figure of some sort. And seems like these women have been made to kind of disappear, to take away the shame from the event and take away the shame from the man who's connected with the event. And as time goes on, we are introduced to their captors. There are three captors, two males and one female, who seem to be inept, seem to not have any real power because between the three of them, their only method of enforcing the law that they're spewing is that one of these men has a baton. But somehow the women seem to fall into their role of repression. They seem to fall into this perceived victimhood, which even though they're made to endure very harsh conditions, they're semi-starved, they're threatened with electrocution, they are forced to perform slave labor in sweltering conditions, and they're beaten and threatened constantly. But it seems like these women, if they were able to unite and band together and come up with a plan that they would be easily able to overpower these bungling guards. Because even as the situation continues, we realize that those who are jailing them are also being jailed themselves because the person who's supposed to be coming, the person who they've been expecting to come and continue to enforce these conditions or maybe provide a release or some explanation, that person doesn't come. And so they all seem like they're trapped here together. These 13 people seem to be just trapped in this situation. And I feel like the author did a lot of really clever things with this story in that she really explored the culture, the Stockholm Syndrome, where even though these young women, and they are very young women, some of them are teenagers, some of them are in their early 20s, and really their shame has come from their exploring their sexuality, exploring their womanhood within some kind of freedom. 
in this situation, they seem like they're still sexually attracted to some of these men. Well, at least one of the men is being described as barefooted, dreadlocks with golden skin, as though he's not just the man who is their captor and their jailer and the person who is inflicting these harsh conditions on them. He's the person who has shaved their heads, but yet they still see him as some kind of a sex symbol. <laughs> and in exploring the psychology of this situation, in exploring how the women have to reverse the roles that are given to them in order for them to survive, I thought that the author achieved a really brilliant commentary on society, on women, on perceived victimhood versus real victimhood, and sometimes the compromises that one needs to make in order to survive, where Sometimes it feels like the only way that you can save yourself is when you're willing to give your life up for something else. And there were things about this book that I, I didn't like. I felt like it had a really slow start up until about page 120. The book is a pretty short book. It's only about 220 pages. And for the first almost a half of it, I didn't feel like the story went as far as I wanted it to go in that period of time. But what she achieved in the second half of the book, I thought was pure brilliance in, in the commentary that she made and in the comparisons that she made between the various characters and the compromises that they made and what they had to do, the, the, the arcs of their character as they will themselves to survive even in these adverse circumstances. And so while I could really focus on the criticisms that I had of this story, I want to focus instead on what it achieved. And I think that what it achieved, it did it brilliantly. So I'm recommending The Natural Way of Things by Charlotte Wood. I don't know what her other books are like and whether she continues this kind of theme and this exploration of the roles of female, the changing face of a woman in society. I don't know if that is something that comes through in her other novels. It says in the back that she has authored five other novels and a book of nonfiction. And I don't know what she writes about in general, but I highly recommend this one. I know there are people who didn't love it because they felt like the book had some ridiculous points. And I don't feel like they saw like we looked at the same things but thought different things about it like the idea that we have 10 women essentially being ruled by one man with a stick there are no guns there are no bombs the things that we expect to be powerful weapons are not really present and the interaction between the characters the interaction between the captors and the interaction between the prisoners seems to be a little weird just because i looked at this book and thought it was brilliant doesn't necessarily mean that you will have the same take on it but i recommend that you try it and don't stop at a page 120 like i was tempted to do read the whole thing and then see if you love it so that was book number 62 and those are three of my recent reads leave me a comment down below let me know if you've read any of these books and if you have other books by these authors that you'd like to recommend to me i'd love to hear from you down there as well thanks for watching this video give me a thumbs up if you liked it subscribe if you want to see more and let's talk in the comments and until next time happy reading bye